Greetings, Cultivation World. Jordan River back with more Growcast, telling you to watch your crobes. Today, we have brand new guest Jason from Filter and Lighthouse Solutions. Really, really great guest. A little bit of a departure from our monthly theme, but not really. It does pertain, and it's a great episode. So I wanted you guys to get this one ASAP, and I know you're going to love it. Big thank you to Jason. Before we jump in, though, with Jason... Shout out to The Order of Cultivation. Have you seen our little secret society of growers? That's right. You can join up today. I'll refund your entry fee and check it out all you like. Hundreds of hours of bonus content, individual garden support, access to our cultivation community. We are the cult fam, everybody, the cultivation family. And if you're a positive, like-minded grower looking to uplift others, not bag on each other or focus on the things that drive us apart, hate on each other for different gardening styles. That's not what we're about. We put the plant first, truly. We'll get your garden problem solved. You can check out all of our awesome bonus content. And that's all at growcastpodcast.com slash membership. What are you waiting for, everybody? The Order of Cultivation is ready to welcome you with open arms. And like I said, it's a cultivation family. We'll see you there, everybody. Growcastpodcast.com slash membership. Join up uh, before the end of the month. I'll refund that joint fee. Consume the content. If you don't like it, hop out. Order of Cultivation growcastpodcast.com forward slash membership we'll see you there everybody you won't regret it all right let's get into it with jason thank you for listening and enjoy the show hello podcast listeners you are now listening to growcast i'm your host jordan river and i want to thank you for tuning in again today before we get started as always i urge you to share the show tell a grower tell a smoker about growcast get someone growing that's our mission here at growcast And be sure to check out The Order of Cultivation, our membership over at growcastpodcast.com slash membership. It's the greatest, our little secret society of growers. Don't tell anyone. Today, we are talking about microbial control. And my God, do we have the correct person on the line for that? From Lighthouse Solutions, from Filter, and so much more, we have Jason H., uh, also known as the Dyslexic Stoner on Instagram. What's up, Jason? How you been, man? I've been great. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on and uh, any opportunity to help build the knowledge base of of the growers uh, in your audience and beyond is always a pleasure because I feel like, you know, at the end of it all, a smarter grower makes wiser decisions and doesn't look at mold control like a huge earth shattering problem. You know what I mean? (laughs) It's just another thing to handle. Man, yeah, this is an interesting niche that you found yourself in, and you really go deep. I do love the Instagram page, Dyslexic Stoner 402. You'll find Jason Hadley up there. Again, look for Filter. That is the brand. Jason, what brought you into cannabis cultivation and then eventually this invisible world of microbe control and compliance? Well, I'd always been a fan of the plant for quite some time, um, and mm-hmm, then it mm-hmm. turned out... Uh, <laughs> You know, what forced my hand into the industry, ironically, was like unemployment. You know, uh, I sort of fell into the industry and I I had gotten laid off from a job. Uh, I was in like advertising sales at the time. And uh, so I was collecting unemployment and a buddy of mine was like, hey, do you want to come trim with me for a grower? (laughs) And, uh, you know, it's all, you know, it's all money under the table. And I was like, okay, so I don't have to, you know, report this or anything. But I'm like, no, what are you talking about? Report is the cannabis industry, please. (laughs) And so, uh, you know, like the entire industry was built on people who didn't want to work a day job and didn't want to pay their taxes. Pretty much. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, exactly exactly. right. so it turned out, you know, like I was a fairly decent trimmer and, uh, but you know, like having kind of a mainstream work ethic, it's so funny. Cause like it didn't, I had a hard time adjusting to cannabis world in the sense that, you know, when they say show up at 10 o'clock to start trimming, like I, as like, you know, a mainstream business dude, I'm there at nine fifty, right. ready to go. Right. <laughs> you know, I get my, if coffee, you're on time, you're late. Into, <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. And so, so, but in cannabis world, they're like, 10 o'clock, what are you doing here? I'm not ready for you yet. <laughs> He's rolling out of bed. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, 10 o'clock. Right, right, come on in. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Like, they're still fucking stuff down. And, you know, it was like a, it was a more modest, like, warehouse, two room, you know, room A, room B type of situation. And uh, anyway, so, so it turned out that, you know, having worked there for a few months, they discovered that I could read and write and uh, wanted to bring me on on the staff. And, you know, I kind of asked for it too. I was like, how has this process happened? And they're like, well, you know, let's bring you in. And so I started working 
you know, just kind of the doing the Charlie work, as they say, you know, a lot of the cleaning and all that. <laughs> and then eventually made my way up to, uh, to the, you know, daytime managers and weekend managers positions. And then, you know, as any good chef who works uh, in a kitchen wants to start their own restaurant, I was like, how do I do this for myself? Cause you know, when you're trimming and you're realizing you're getting whatever you're getting per pound, but you're starting to calculate out what this room produces, right. you're like, I am at the wrong end of this. <laughs> right. And so, so it turns out that I end up, uh, you know, getting it together, getting into commercial grow space, um, hanging out there for a little while, basically made the mistake of uh, taking over, buying somebody else's grow as opposed to like building from the ground up, mm. but you know, costs were what they were. So now, whoever built that place before me uh, consulted on like Dr. Seuss level architecture <laughs> and, you know, like, it was just, you know, it would have never survived in a compliant world. Right. Yeah. It was just basically like a glorified uh, trap grower, you know? And um, that's so true. But, you know, I'll tell you what, working a 24 lighter by yourself, you know, while your investors are who banging on you about what you're producing out of that place teaches you a lot and gets you knowing about every moving part within that facility. And, uh, and then at some point we were in a, a, a garage section, you know, like with a bunch of roll up doors and stuff and they were all segmented up and there were a bunch of other growers there. So we were constantly having problems with molds and mildews and what mm -hmm. have you and getting everybody else's problems like that, that industrial park was just a microbial swingers club. And, uh, and we couldn't figure out why at the time. And I didn't have that knowledge. And then, Lo and behold, one of them was stealing power, and so they raided the entire building, and that was the end of my career oh. as a commercial grower. <laughs> yeah, but but I'll say this: that I definitely found a home in the cannabis industry. I was like, this is these are my people. Like, this is amazing. And I had already had a bunch of sales experience, so it turned out the grower that I was working for originally that I got learned all the ropes from started a an automation company called Smart Bee Controllers, and I was one of his sales guys for a while. That company, you know, kind of started to fall into disarray. It was time to move on and ended up over at uh, at Spectrum King LED. Oh, get out LED of here. Lighting, which, we just had Brendan on the show. Oh, yeah. Brendan's great. I love working with Brendan. He is, his curmudgeoniness is part of his charm, and <laughs> I admire him for it, you know? And so I was over there for a little while, learned a lot about lighting. Also learned that lighting is very much a race to the bottom when it comes to, you know, pricing and sellability. Right. And there's a lot of competition out there. And then in the meantime, it turned out that I had been just constantly trying to sell lights to this guy that I had met through uh, the Smart Bee people. And uh, I didn't realize, I didn't understand the scope of Lighthouse Worldwide Solutions, which was the company he worked for. They were releasing this product. And he's like, listen, you've been calling me about lighting for forever. Clearly, you're a decent sales dude. Like, we're releasing this filtration product. We'll teach you everything you need to know about microbe control. Do you want to make a change? And I was like, I... Yeah, I was like, I cannot wait. Holy shit. So I landed over at Lighthouse and the first like four days was just a crash course in microbe control and understanding it because Lighthouse has been like neck deep for like the last 35 years uh, in the pharmaceutical, automotive, food manufacturing spaces. And they basically do what are what's called real-time particle monitoring for uh, clean room environments. Uh -huh. So clean rooms, as the name would imply, are very tightly regulated because you have to maintain certain amounts of particle levels within your air. And that's like dust and mold and other bits that are in the air. Mm -hmm. You have to maintain certain thresholds in order to hold a specific clean room rating. So they make these systems that help develop that. And then they also have like handheld versions. And this filter unit, it's a commercial size HEPA unit that they basically, you know, it's about getting the problems out of the air. And that was the big thing that I realized when it came to microbe control in cannabis is that, you know, a lot of people tend to spec in their HVAC systems based on cooling capacity. And air filtration prior to compliance has always been sort of an afterthought. It was more just like keeping dust out of the room, yep. which, you know, of course you want to do. But, you know, you always wanted to cheap out on HVAC. What's the lowest price you can get that can offer the maximum cooling against your lights and whatever other heat generating systems you're running within your facility. And so, you know, they basically were like, listen, you know, if, if this industry needs to take from pharma and food manufacturing, take those practices translate them down into what's applicable and usable for them and, you know, kind of working both the sales side, working the cultivation side, 
you know, having like a long career as a, as a stand up comic for many years here around LA. It's like <laughs> all of that kind of came together it, at once because it's like I was able to translate to the growers with knowledge that they didn't have and make it in a way that was digestible for them to understand and apply. Wow, dude. Yeah. That is a fucking incredible story. Thanks, man. Yeah, and I'm loving it ever since. I, I have a lot to dig into there. I have so much that I want to dig into. I, instantly, we're going to go off the rails a little bit, though, and talk about, sure. you know, I get messages a lot about how do I get into the cannabis industry? And it's such a complex mm -hmm. question with so many different facets and answers. And, and I'll often say, you know, do something unique ancillary to the cannabis industry that kind of plays into it because mm -hmm. growing is hard. Like you said, you end up as a trimmer and all that. Hearing your story, though, is really interesting because you, you, you kind of just detailed that. It kind of seemed like you were just grinding, like nose to the grindstone. Here's another one I hear yeah. a lot, like old school professional occupational mentality. Like you said, don't go into it like the other... Uh, kind of stony trimmers go into it like a real job. Yeah. But what advice do you have to offer? Like having heard that story, you know, getting into the cannabis industry, it sounds like you just grinded and grinded until opportunity presented itself. Yeah. You know, I, I got to tell you because yeah, it was like at the, in like the heyday of California's gray market. So it was like, there was a lot of volume of growers that were out there, but there wasn't a lot of like ways of, it was a lot of networking, if you will, because the thing was, is that I wasn't just a trimmer for the guy I was growing for. I, then I started to meet other trimmers. Those trimmers turned me on to other growers. Mm -hmm. And then at a certain point I was making my entire income off of trimming and I'd be at different spots from like day to day and you know, whatever. And obviously now knowing what I know now in the microbe control game, that mm, probably not the best idea, but <laughs> you know, and we but can no, we'll touch on that a little bit more. And networking, but, though, that's that is such a good point. Oh yeah, well, you know what? Here's the thing. It's like uh, I showed up on time, well, maybe a little early to the, you know to some people. <laughs> I was the last one to stay. Mm -hmm. If somebody needed somebody to stay and help trim extra stuff, I did it because you know, like these guys, these growers. You know, it's like once you become a grower, like you never want to trim weed again. Yeah, you, it's you, true. Just, you know, you're like now you're above it, right? And so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I get it. I get That's it. True. You know, it's like when the owner, when the grower's wife comes in and she's just the queen bee of the facility. And it's like, you can tell like everybody's just loving to be in a big fish in their pond, right? <laughs> it's true. It's true. They did just spend 12 weeks growing the fucking thing. You're tired of it at that point. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so, so, but then it turns out that like, there's just been this, you know, because of the need for trimmers and section workers and stuff like that. The biggest recommendation, I was actually on a plane uh, talking to a, a fellow passenger with our masks on, of course. Um, you know, I was talking to a fellow passenger and we were just chatting about what we do. And she was a college student. She's like, I would love to get into that. And it turns out that there are now cannabis employment recruiting agencies. You know, those are Googleable. You can just Google cannabis industry jobs nowadays and you will get, I think uh, the company's called Vanxt, V A N S. They're V A N G S T banks. Uh, they're an employer, uh, a headhunter for that. Um, Indeed.com has a crazy amount of cannabis jobs that are available in section workers, trimmers, leads, you know, sales, you know, like pretty much a lot of different aspects of the industry. So now that the industry's gone more mainstream, thanks to compliance, I know that, you know, compliance presents problems on other levels. But from an employment standpoint, you're able to like have access to these growers because now they're able to like come out from the shadows and be out in the open. And they've always had employment needs. It was just hard to find good people and be able to like maintain the secrecy of your spot. You right. Know? No, that's absolutely right. You know, I kind of cut my teeth in Humboldt County around the same time that you're saying that that beautiful gray market Goldilocks zone that we were in where dispensaries could take flour from anybody. And usually, to be honest, like you said, it was probably a little under, just a little bit under regulated. Generally, they would test your bud by smoking it. I did have some dispensaries that would actually test your bud and then they would establish a good relationship. And if you could produce good product, you'd be able to sell your wares. Again, all of these gray market growers. It was a wonderful time as far as, you know, from a grower's perspective. Sure. But you're right. I would have never been able to survive compliance. Yeah. I, none of those, not none, but most of those folks would never have been able to pass. And and let's, we're going to dive deep into that. If you think it's um, overregulated or if there's work to go or, you know, quantitative versus qualitative, all this fun stuff, we'll get into it. Sure. But, um, yeah. I do look at that as the heyday and I agree with you. I don't think many people are passing compliance the way they were growing back then. 
No, and that's the thing that compliance changed is it's like, you know, I mean, you got to remember that, again, it's like, you know, people got into the industry because they didn't want to work day jobs. They didn't want to pay taxes. There was no accountability short of if you got busted by law enforcement, right? So now all of these guys are, gonna, are being forced to change their methodologies to solve a problem that they don't know anything about. They don't know how it enters. They don't know the behavior of it. They don't know how to eradicate it. They don't know how to prevent it. So it's like, I get, I typically get two types of calls. You know, I I get the call that is like, Hey, we understand that this is an issue that we don't know anything about help bring us up to speed. And then the other one is, Oh my gosh, I'm failing testing. What do I do? What do I do? You know? And so either both in both cases, man, it's about keeping chill. And making things no problem, you know, honestly, like my biggest competitor is not um, Aero Clean 420 or Aero Spy Sage or Innovative Solutions. My, my, it's not another product. My biggest competition, honestly, is culture shock, mm. is change. Yeah. You know, is like old dogs in the industry going, I didn't get into this business to fill out paperwork. And it's like, I understand that. But the voters didn't fully read the fine print. And here we are. Yeah, you know? no kidding. Absolutely. Here in California, I mean, like a lot of the growers associations were vehemently against legalization here in California. Because, they, you know, when you start to read into the law and you start to read into the fine print, you know, like the, the general voting population is like, it's going to be raining weed in the streets. It's going to be amazing. Right. But meanwhile, the growers are like, well, all the money that we're paying in taxes is going to law enforcement to bust all the black market guys. Yep. It's not even like we're funding anything substantial like schools or social welfare programs or whatever. It's all just like being rolled back into buying machine guns and bulletproof vests. It's crazy. But yeah. in any case, <laughs> politics aside. <laughs> the lack of legacy to legal was uh, despicable. The fact that they were still prosecuting cannabis cases in the courthouse after the bill had passed. Uh-huh. I definitely see Here's, here's my take as a um, kind of crazy libertarian grower, mm-hmm. but um, I just see regulation as another form of control that instead of criminalization, they're going to control through regulation. And that's why that heyday is now over because REC came in and kind of ruined everything in California. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, think, I say the same thing. I say it's drug interdiction from the top down. We will take the fun out of this industry. We will regulate the crap out of you. We will let you invest in millions of dollars in commercial growth space right. and then send some inspector in there to go, oh, well, you can't do that. You got to force you're shutting down, blah, blah, blah. Classic you know? California. They fucking, they, they love to do that with everything, even if you're just building a house. Right. So I do think they kind of ruined it. That being said, I am interested in the kind of, the progression of the collective knowledge when it comes to things like microbial compliance, like this is important right. stuff. I disagree with the old head who doesn't want to learn this stuff because, because knowledge is power and, and this is really fascinating yeah. stuff and it can really affect the health of your garden and the health of your product if it gets way out of whack. Oh, well, and not only that, but if you think about it this way, if you're the guy that's on top of that knowledge and you're able to act and, and, and survive within that framework, you know, that's going to leave a gaping vacuum in the competitive marketplace right. if you want to get product to market. Because like I hear it all the time from people in Colorado where they're like, oh, I went to the dispensary and everything's just goofy and bunk and what have you. And it's like, but those are the guys that figured out how to get the product to market. I'm sure there's plenty of people that can grow sweet leaf, right? Terpenes, smells off the chain. But it's like, if you can't pass a microbe test, it's just a cool trick. Oh, okay. We got to get into this and I want to get into specifics, but let's start at the top. Okay. Because you just said something that made me want to go into living soil and all this fun stuff, but let's start at the top. Yeah. At the very top, why do people fail microbial testing and how do people avoid the common mistakes, misconceptions, that sort of thing? They're small question, big answer. (laughs) So let's see here. we'll, we'll, We'll kind of unpack this. So a lot of the reasons why people fail for microbe control is they're taking old school practices and continuing to apply them in a new regulatory market with a different level of accountability. So before, it's like you just cut the bad part off and put the rest back in the turkey bag. Nobody thought different, right? But now, a laboratory is like the big snitch. And putting that accountability model into your process that now you have to account for. So... That means that you have to, just like when you were building your first spot and you had to look up like how to do plumbing and you had to be, be a part-time electrician and not kill yourself. And you had to be like, you know, you, you had to learn all these different things. You had to go to your uncle that was a plumber and your other uncle that was an electrician and, you know, put everything together. 
you know, you can look to the way that other industries that operate at a higher standard of cleanliness, what they do, and then, you know, just simply reduce it down to what you do. That's like a lot of what my social media posts are about is like, take these high level concepts, boil it down into something that a user, uh, that an end user can understand. Maybe throw a dick joke in there just to soften the blow, so to speak, of like, you know, like in where I can. I mean, I love this audience. They, they, the lowest common denominator of humor, and I thrive and revel in it like a, like a truffle pig, right? And, uh, and so it's like, you know, a, a lot of it is, is taking a look at what they do. So, for example, it would be wise for growers at smaller scales to understand the concept of what's called CGMP. It stands for Current Good Manufacturing Practices. And this is sort of like an architecture of what is applied in food and pharma facilities in order to maintain cleanliness at all phases of the production process. Mm. So this isn't just about, you know, like your flower room is like the accumulation of all of your problems. It probably starts right at the front door when you walk in depending on if that front door is connected to the outside or connected to a bedroom or whatever. But odds are it probably starts from the outside. It works its way in. A lot of people also kind of misunderstand or maybe are not completely aware of the fact that a lot of your problems are in your air. And that can be easily revealed through like what's called air sampling. And so one of the things that I try to do with a lot of my, my clients at, at all levels is like start to understand and connect with industrial hygiene labs. These are laboratories that are testing for compliance within pharma, food, wastewater treatment. They're industrial people. They're not the traditional cannabis lab. Because, I mean, if you think about the conflict of interest of a cannabis lab, for example, they want to present you favorable you know, results by virtue of, I'm not, no, I'm not not necessarily knock these guys, but I mean, high level, it's in their interest to have people continually growing and continually being successful because they'll continue to submit samples for testing and that's how they make their money. Mm -hmm. But the industrial guys, like their clientele have to do it. They don't have a choice. They have to present reports and they get audited and what have you. And they don't have an emotional side of, they don't have an emotional bone in their body when it comes to your test results. So they're going to give it to you straight, right? So getting to know something, uh, you know, like an organization like that that's local to you is going to be huge. And not only that, but like it also helps you get a lay of the land of what your what your grow is is producing at the level that you can't see with the naked eye. Because like by the time you see mold on your plants or on your walls or on your tables or what have you. Right. Like you're probably about like two to three weeks behind the initial outbreak. Yeah, almost too far gone or whatever at that point. Yeah. I mean, listen, there's solutions around it. Don't get me wrong. But at the end of the day, it's like your solution options widen if you can catch it before it becomes a problem. Right. And so part of how that gets handled is not just like making sure you have the right types of cleansers and that you're applying them properly, but also prevention steps as well and being able to keep that out. So I don't know if I answered your question fully. Oh, you definitely (laughs) did, man. That's all there. I would love to dig into the air sampling and air quality part. We'll be right back with Jason. But before that, this plant revolution, everybody, the makers of the great white line of products. You've seen the great white myco, the king crab beneficial bacteria and the orca liquid mycorrhiza, of course, not to mention their myco chum, which feeds it all, baby. That's right, that mycochum, the high-quality molasses, a micronutrient blend, a couple other goodies in there, really lets your rhizosphere take off. You will not be disappointed when you add that mycochum, how fast your biology bursts forth. Again, I love to use their liquid orca, right? Getting that fungal dominance throughout flower. I think it's a good idea, even if you're already using a transplant mycorrhiza, to use that liquid orca as well, you know? It doesn't hurt to reapply. Plus, it's got a couple of strains of beneficial bacteria in there as well. You guys know I love these products, and one of the reasons is they're super, super clean. You can add them to virtually any grow, and that's a big deal for me because I recommend products that has to work across a wide variety of systems And Plant Revolution, with their great white line, really does that. So check them out in your local hydro store. They're everywhere. Or find them at plantrevolution.com. Try the great white. Try the king crab. Try the orca or mycochum. You will not regret it. All right, everyone. Let's get back to Jason. I would love to dig into the air sampling and air quality part. um, Simply because I think it may apply to me. I've been struggling with like weird fungal infections. So 
-hmm. Growing in Humboldt was awesome. I realized moving from one state to another and starting gardening again, mm -hmm. man, gardens really take on a life of their own. Oh, yeah. Like, so much of your success as a gardener, especially in the beginning, has to just do with your garden, where it is, the climate, mm -hmm. what's in the air, what's in the water supply, all of these things. That's why you oftentimes see these people like, you know, crush it in a closet and then someone hires them at a facility and then they go and fail. It's like it was your, it was yeah. the garden that was, that was thriving. You as the gardener is, are, you're kind of inputting into the garden, but a lot of it is not out of your control, but a lot of it is kind of built in, right? Oh, so yeah, absolutely. I think that that's something you battle with all the time is dealing with the specifics of the grow. And I've been battling with that si since my move. I've been, I've been dealing with a mystery fungal infection. Mm -hmm. Someone said that they think it might be because of you know, just the mold in the air. My understanding is that these particles are in the air. It just depends on their concentration and whether or not they can take hold on your plant. Yes. You can tell me what you think, but I had, I had members of my discord, you know, members of our, of our membership program uh -huh. saying, Oh, I'm a contractor. And, and we knocked, knocked down a, a, a wall in a basement and found a window that had been kind of concrete sealed over. And it was just all molded out and it was weeping through the concrete and they're freaking me out, yeah. but, but you tell me what you think about, you know, the possibility of this being in the room, being in the air and all of that. Well, sure. So, so first and foremost, to speak to the first part of what you said, you know, I work with a lot of consultants as well. And because, you know, they have their hands in a lot of different projects. So it, it worked it for me to keep in contact with them. And, you know, I will say this, that I, I, one of the things I've had to help them kind of undo is the concept of like, everybody wants to apply a template. You know, like you don't want to have to outthink the problem. You just want to come up with your template and replicate your results anywhere you go. Right. But the conditions are not always the same from place to place. So when you build out this one great facility and then you take that template and you put it someplace else and it fails miserably, there's yes, there's other factors that are involved. So. Right. That being said, yes, the problem is is oftentimes in your air. I mean, there's multiple ways that, that they can come in, and I'll touch on a few of those, but, but air being one of them. I, air, I would say, is the one that is disregarded or ignored the most. Not necessarily willfully, just people don't think about it because you have to remember that in cannabis, your smallest particle threat is one micron. And like, in other words, like the size of the smallest mold spore that would affect compliance is one micron. That uh -huh. is one twenty-five thousandth of an inch. <laughs> or it's like some other, you know, some ungodly number. But like the naked eye can only see down to 30 to 50 microns. And that's under like excellent con lighting conditions. Right. And you have perfect 2020 vision and like you stuck a carrot up your ass before you look. <laughs> the, the problem that you're trying to find typically is, requires instrumentation. You know what I'm saying? Just as yes. much as like you have a CO2 detector in your in your garden because you can't see the CO2, but you need to be able to know what that level is. Same thing with particles. Like so, for example, a one micron particle. If uh, they do an experiment, right, where they take a, a one meter glass tube, right, in a laboratory, like there's no air disturbance whatsoever and perfectly still air. If you drop a one micron particle, it will take. 4.7 hours to fall one meter in still air, in perfectly still air. Get out of here. Five, five hours to fall 3.2 feet. Because of the resistance of the gas particles, it's like right. wading well, its way through it? Yeah, gravity is, uh, affects it differently than it does you and I falling off Jesus. a building. You know what I mean? If we were to fall off a three-story building, we, we'd fall pretty quick. I didn't you imagine know? that. I, I just imagined them kind of uh, amalgamating all over the air. I didn't imagine them as kind of slowly falling and shifting. Well, there is, they are. I mean, in effect, they are because you have what's called particle pressure, and that is sort of the density of the particles that are in that given space. So in other words, like if you could see the particles that were one micron and up, like if you were sitting in the room you're in right now, you wouldn't be able to see the opposite wall. It would look like TV static to your eyes. Right, right. You know what I mean? But again, you know, because of the, the reason that, you know, that our eyes can only see down to a certain point is that's where you, it requires instrumentation, like what are called particle counters or air samplers to be able to draw air onto a Petri dish that you can send to a lab for later analysis. And so... The other thing to consider as well, and, and, and just to kind of give you some context in the clean room environment, in clean rooms, the reason they're able to get their particles out of their air is because they do what's called unidirectional airflow. 
So within their manufacturing facility, within their what's called a critical area, they have um, interspersed in the ceiling tiles, like along with the lights, are what are called fan filter units. And these are like HEPA units that are continually cleaning the air, but all of the airflow is moving at the same speed and is evenly distributed across the entire ceiling down to the floor. Whoa. And then that air goes into floor intakes, like intakes down at the baseboards, and then it goes back up into a dead wall space, and then it is sucked back through the fan filter units and then back into the room. So they're trying to like clean as much of their own air as possible. So they measure it in what are called air exchanges, where, where how many times is the air fully exchanged within that room? So unidirectional airflow, all of the air moves down from the ceiling to the floor at the same rate. Now, go to cannabis. Cannabis has what's called a turbulent airflow environment where you have doors opening and closing, you have fans that are going, you have HVAC that's just run a, like ducts along the top corners or the center of the ceiling. So if you think about a one micron particle taking five hours to fall one meter in perfectly still air. Still air. That's not what we're dealing with. No, it stands to reason that a one micron particle will never touch the floor in the time that it's in the room. Jeez. And so that gives it an opportunity to attach to different surfaces. And you have to consider that mold has made a 450 million year career out of being an opportunist. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? In other words, 100%. Like mold, yeah, mold in a natural environment in the forest, for example, mold is the great recycler of life. It, well, it's what breaks down, you know, organic matter into you know, the nutrients that the forest floor can uptake for grasses right. and bushes and trees and what have you. I mean, if you think about it, you're trying to take this like otherwise natural process, put it in a controlled environment and only pick and choose the things that you want. It's like nature will find a way. No kidding. And then take the fallibility of humans who like human beings are the worst thing for a grow. I know that's horrible to say, but like we are the, we are the most dangerous thing to our plants. Yeah, totally. We're undisciplined. Right. We're um, we're we're greedy. We're uh, we're lazy. Mm -hmm. We're <laughs> we're naturally. We well, have to fight back against those things and build your character in order to just succeed as a gardener. That's why I believe gardeners oh. are 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 generally cool people, and cannabis growers are generally tr better, trustworthy, more positive people. And not only that, though, but like we are made up of like thirty nine trillion bacteria and microbes and whatever. The average human hand has ten thousand microbes per square inch. My God. Right. And if you think about a one micron particle, right, we should have smoked the J before we talked about this because I love talking. I'm smoking now, man. <laughs> yeah, keep it gets, going. It gets so, the audience is loving it. It gets so mind blowing, right? So think about this just from a perspective standpoint. Like the valley of your fingerprint is like maybe 20 to 40 microns deep. Oh, that's fascinating. Like the space, the valley between the ridges of your fingerprint. Or to put it in another perspective, like a one micron particle, if you were to put it next to a sheet of paper, right, that thin, that tiny edge of the mm -hmm. sheet of paper, from a perspective standpoint, that would be like you looking up the Empire State Building. Wow, that's a good one. I like that. Right, right. So that's the level. And, and that thing, that one mold spore, right, that one mold spore, it grows into a hypha, which is like a stalk, if mm -hmm. you will. Once it's rooted, it grows into a stalk. And then that stock produces anywhere from hundreds to thousands more spores. Right. And, you know, if you think about it at scale, like to a one micron particle, like, uh, like us blowing out a birthday candle to a one micron particle is like a category five gale force wind. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I totally, and that particle, that one micron particle is like looking for any place to attach. And that's why it produces so many of them because so many of them will not turn into anything that, it, you know, it's accuracy through volume. Eventually it will find a piece of organic matter to land wow. on to begin to thrive. Eventually it'll, it'll attach to your clothing. And then like you're going from room one to room two, and now you've taken that particle with you. And so there's a lot of like potential cross contamination. Okay. I'd love to jump in just for a second and ask you home grower scale before we get off of this subject. Yeah. When it comes to testing the air, is it, are there air testing, you know, PPM testers that are affordable? Are there labs that'll test your air that are kind of applicable and affordable for a home grower? 
Yeah, well, yes and no. Like, in other words, there's nothing out there that's really like what I would call real time definitive testing. I think that I, I heard of something recently that was being used like uh, in the pollen marketplace that they're kind of converting into the cannabis marketplace. But even still, a lot of those types of things like are detecting sizes and then there are just they, they kind of catalog every known particle or pathogen and then kind of measured against that. So it's like, it's really hard for like some device to be able to tell you it's okay. Aspergillus niger. Sure. You know what I mean? But as a home grower, is it just best that we assume the worst and filter out? Our, like why even get a reader if they're expensive and all that? Should we just assume the worst and make sure that we have good filtration? Well, yeah, I, I would say, you know, if you act as if you always have it, you're always ready for it. But from a, from a sampling standpoint, your options at like the patient and, and home grow level all the way up to commercial um, there's a couple of different options. So typically it's going to involve a Petri dish and Petri dishes are fairly easy to come by. You can talk to any lab, they'll sell them to you. I mean, you can buy them on Amazon, what have you. And and so if you're going to buy a Petri dish, you want uh, what that agar, which is that goop at the bottom of the Petri dish, mm -hmm. you want what's called malt extract agar or MEA, an MEA Petri dish, right? Okay. That That's going to capture most of your molds. So there's two different ways to handle it. There is in uh, top end pharmaceutical world, they use a, what's called active air sampling. And that's where they have a device where they put the Petri dish in and they turn the device on and it basically pulls a very specifically measured volume of air at a very specific speed in order to collect a sample so that you have consistency in your sampling methodology. Because, you know, you want to be able to make sure you're pulling the same five minutes of air in every location. And then it has to be at a certain speed because just like us, if we hit a wall too fast, we splat. If we hit it too slow, we'll go around it. Wow. Right? So that that's called uh, active air sampling. And that usually entails a device. Wouldn't you know I happen to sell those? But there are plenty of other manufacturers out there as well. Then on the other end, like let's say the food industry, for example, like a pie factory, they'll do what's called passive air sampling because they're, they're looking for different stuff. Like food manufacturing has different regulatory requirements than say producing Tylenol and Viagra, right? So in food manufacturing, they will do what's called a passive air sample. And that's where they take that same Petri dish. They leave it on a countertop and they walk away from it for 15 minutes. They cap it and they send it off to the lab. But again, there's like certain drawbacks. There's give and take. So with active air sampling, you have consistency of your of your results or your consistency of your methodology, you know, but you're paying a pretty penny for the equipment to be able to do it. You know, it's not to say that a bunch of growers couldn't co-opt in on one and pass it around as long as you're wiping it down effectively. You know, you're not taking something tainted and putting it into someone else's spot. But then um, when it comes to passive air sampling, there's a couple of drawbacks, meaning that like, number one, if somebody walks by, they're going to create a bunch of wind from their walking, which is going to adulterate the sample, right? You're not going to get the truest of what's falling down oh, on the thing, Jesus. you know, but then as well, on the other side of that too, is that remember if the one micron particle takes 4.7 hours to fall in still air, what are the odds that it's going to hit the Petri dish? You know what I mean? Mm. And then on top of that, if you leave a Petri dish out for too long and too much stuff settles on it, when somebody's looking at the Petri dish under a microscope from a laboratory standpoint, they're looking overhead. So the problem that you have might be obscured by other material that's fallen on top of it as it's stuck to the agar. So that's where like, I try to preach a lot of like putting as much science into this as possible as opposed to like bro science. My buddy says, my buddy says, we'll get your room killed straight up. I've seen it happen a million times, you know, <laughs> man, I was just laughing because you must drive yourself crazy with this shit. Like this is oh, it yeah. clearly it takes a certain mind to get deep into this because it seems so intricate, so sensitive. Like you're saying, oh, well, if someone yeah. walks by the whole fucking thing's off. So that's <laughs> right. Well, and that's the funny thing too. I mean, it, it, it creates this weird life for me. I live in this duality of like, I can't eat birthday cake now after somebody blows candles <laughs> out over it because I know what's on the frosting. Right. Holy but meanwhile, that does, 
that doesn't stop me from like going after my wife like a truffle pig going at it. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't, you know, like there's certain give and take where I'm like, well, acceptable risk. We, we tend, yeah, risk. we tend to pick and choose our our values. That's a, another human part of the human condition. Yeah. Speaking of which, speaking of the microbiome, let's um, this goes hand in hand with something that I wanted to ask you. You know, my understanding is these microbial tests don't distinguish the species of bacteria that's on something if they're doing a bacteria test. Now I'm a living soil grower. Mm -hmm. Not only am I a living soil grower and, and please, I'm sure, I'm sure I'm going to get something wrong. Let me finish. And then you can go ahead and push back, correct or amend. Now as a living soil grower, we're not in a sterile environment, quite the opposite. And not many people are spraying compost tea on their flowering plants, but, but we are definitely rich with fungi and bacteria that are beneficial. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but I also do do another show, the coffee health and science podcast, and we're learning the link between th- that very important bacteria in the soil linking to and creating and spawning and, and synergizing with the bacteria in our gut, which largely determines how healthy we are in our immune system and the diseases that we develop and inflammation overall, all these different things. I'm deep into mm-hmm. the microbiology myself, not on the control side, but on the kind of health and science and, and regenerative agriculture side. So let me ask you. Do these tests account for good and bad bacteria? Do you see living soil growers failing more than none? And uh, what do you think of that as far as from like a health perspective? Just because something's sterile and won't um, harm the sensitive doesn't mean that it's necessarily healthiest for everybody. What do you think of all those yeah. crazy words? Well, okay. So, so to break that down, to unpack that a little bit, I would say that like Good and bad bacteria from a testing standpoint is really more our perspective because of the way that we're applying and utilizing those types of bacteria. So the testing side of things is just trying to find any and all bacteria. And I guess it's technically up to you to figure out what works and what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Secondly, unfortunately, when it comes to living soils and like coirs and cocos and stuff like that, anything organic, right? Anything that's based in organics, you're in effect bringing the problem in because like, I mean, a teaspoon of soil has 40,000 different microbe species in it, right? Mm -hmm. Some of them are helpful. Some of them aren't, right? From a compliance standpoint, it's made even worse because like if your state is testing for total yeast and mold count, anything that that test will catch is going to count against you. Yeah. You know, and and I see this all the time because I'll go to clients and I'll do like air sampling and stuff for like commercial scale clients. And, you know, and I'll say, yeah, you found cladosporium, but every facility has cladosporium, but you're not, you know, like you're held to, depending on your state, like here in California, it's four Mm. types of aspergillus, E. coli, salmonella. Right. Anything after that, they don't really care. Oh, okay. You know? So that's interesting. So it all depends is what you're saying. Yeah, it depends a lot of on what your state regulatory needs are. And huh. if you were ever looking to set up a grow, you try to set up in like the loosest regulatory environment possible, right? Whereas California is a very strict microbial environment. The wow. good news is it, it's actually better to know that, that, that to have that stricter model because at least you know if you fail for, for, for you know, or I mean, if you, um, you know, are sampling and you're testing hot for stuff that doesn't matter to the governing board of regulators that are allowing you bear, you know, allowing you to cross into retail or cross into being able to actually sell your product. Cool. You know what I mean? So, and every state's different. And until there's some kind of federal compliance, there's, it's just every state's going to be its own deal. And some of these states um, base it off of what's called the U S pharmacopoeia. And that is a, that is a document that is sort of a standard in the production of pharmaceuticals and nutraceuticals and supplements. And it's just sort of a general catch all of like, well, you want to avoid things that produce harmful mycotoxins, right. which are like the, the metabolite, the secondary metabolites of mold, right. right? Sort of like the equivalent of our sweat or our urine. It's like, that's, uh, yeah, it, you know, mycotoxins. It's the shit what, they what put out. Yeah. I, I've had it uh, described yeah. as their saliva to kind of, you know break right. down exactly. whatever they're yes. fucking with. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, exactly. So so that being said, you know, and unfortunately, sometimes depending on what's at stake and depending on the client, you know, I have to have some some hard discussions with these guys and go, listen, you're operating 13 flower rooms and everything in here is in soil. And it's like, if you test your soil, you're going to find that there's aspergillus in it. So you're bringing the problem in. At what point are you willing to tolerate that level of risk? So, 
you know, and has to start to have discussions about growing in more inner media, you know, wow. like the rock wolves and what happens. That you. worries me, man. So I see both sides of this. I definitely see both sides of this. Here's, here's what I know. We do a lot of testing, um, uh, purity coffee, of course, uh, the company that I create mm-hmm. content for, uh, really, you would love these guys, man. They focus on creating the world's healthiest coffee. They test for healthy compounds. They test for pesticide residue. They test for mycotoxins. That's why I, I'm deep on the mycotoxin world. So they go around to all these farms mm-hmm. and they find the healthiest coffee, no residues of pesticide, no mycotoxins it must be zero or we're not even touching it. Anyways, uh, uh code river, by the way, at purity coffee. Mm-hmm. So I do all sorts of mycotoxin research with them. And what we found is that I, I was talking to Ildi over there and she was saying how most of the, of the regenerative farms that we test, they, they pop hotter way more than the large scale, strict, sterile farms. Mm-hmm. But the problem is we're also testing for high levels of phytochemicals, chlorogenic acid, malic acid, trigonaline. Mm-hmm. Imagine the, these are coffee's versions of THC and terpenes and things like that. Right. It's, the, it's the exact same idea. Well, guess what? I'll have the highest level. Guess what's all the healthiest coffee. It's all regeneratively grown. Mm. So regeneratively grown simultaneously pop the most for mycotoxins. Mm-hmm. But then when you weed through and finds the one that don't, they're virtually always out competing the synthetically large scale grown ones when it comes to the phytochemical compounds that are within them. They're blowing them away. Yeah. So I see both sides. You can't, you can't have, you can't be, you can't be drinking mycotoxins every day. That's bad for you. Right. But at the same time, we, we can't be so stringent with our testing that we're not allowed to grow regeneratively, which a, uh, regenerates the earth and is sustain a B is sustainable and C is healthier. So that's, that's my kind of concern with the state of California going, Hey, you got to grow in rock wool for real. Yeah. You know, I know, I know. Well, so, so the answer to that is, is risk management. You know, it's like, it's one of those things where like, if you can eliminate all of the other risks, then at least, you know, that the only thing that is the risk is your grow media. Sure. And then, and then you can look at other options around how you want to play that, how creative you want to get around it. But I mean, it's like at a certain point, like how many failed crops are you willing to put up with before, you know, you either make a change or you business. Right. I mean, you operate within this world. You're just trying to get people to pass their compliance. That's all you're trying to do. Exactly. And that's all anyone can do. I just worry that they're going to make regenerative agriculture virtually unfeasible. Like that's a scary thought. No, I know. And that's, that's, that, that is a, a huge trend. And unfortunately, it's also one of the cleaner ways to do it too. If, if, again, as long as you do it right, because I mean, like if, you know, I'm almost in favor of regenerative grows because there's so much that is produced and released through the chop and the cleanup process Yes, that you're continually like reinfecting your environment. You know, and, and let me also just kind of speak to something as well that, that you mentioned and you touched on, and I just want to offer a little bit more clarification. So, you know, there are various levels of clean. So at one end is like dirt removal, right? Like just general cleaning to remove dirt. And then at the other end is what you would call sterilization. Mm-hmm. And then there, there are points of cleanliness in between. So again, you know, like Sterilization is a very specific term, meaning that there is nothing organic on that, whatever it is you're cleaning, like if it's a scissors or if it's a grow paper sure. or whatever. So the target that, that cause I don't want to scare a lot of your growers into thinking that like they have to all of a sudden like grow in a condom or whatever, you know what I mean? I don't want to like create that kind of crazy. Right. But what I do want to say is that it, you do want to have an eye on the term that I think a lot of the, the growing community needs to latch onto it's just simply disinfection. Oh, okay. You know what I'm That's saying? That's the level of cleanliness that we're trying to achieve. Yeah, you're trying to achieve disinfection. So you want to clean it better than a, you know, than a than a restaurant table, but you don't necessarily need to autoclave everything that you do. And so where a lot of that comes into, and this is kind of maybe transitioning into like how cleansers are applied and a little bit more about cleansers, is that there are a few things. Like for instance, um, one of the things you want to be aware of is what's called contact time. So every microbe, whether you're cleaning with cleansers or you're applying UV or you're, you know, whatever it is, every particle, every like organic particle has what's called a minimum contact time. 
So for instance, any one of your listeners can go under your sink right now and you can take a look at the back of your bottle of Lysol. And if you look at the back of the bottle of Lysol, well, on the front of the Lysol, it says kills 99.9% of all germs, right? right. There's a big germs. fat asterisk on that. Right? <laughs> yeah, there asterisk. is an asterisk. And the word germs is even strange, but go ahead. Yes, yes. Uh, that's a whole other conversation, right? And so <laughs> what it comes down to is that like, if you look at the back where that asterisk leads you to, it will tell you like spray and leave wet for 30 seconds to kill salmonella or spray and leave wet for 10 minutes to kill rotavirus or coronavirus, right? So different microbes have different requirements. And so the more you can know about uh, understanding the behavior and eradication of mold spores, for example, the better you are at like applying your cleansers and the more effective your cleansers would be. So oh. when people are doing their cleaning, for example, the days of like spray, spray, wipe, wipe, wax on, wax off, <laughs> it's like done. You know I what know. I mean? Like That's what really, I do. <laughs> yeah. No, you really got to like look at the backs of your labels and you have to understand, number one, what the minimum contact time is. And number two, you want to spray it and leave wet. And then there is uh, an actual like correlation to, uh, this might get a little bit in the weeds here, no, but there's what's, called a, a, there's what's called a log kill rate. So for instance, if you apply like 99.9% of, of microbes are killed, that means like for every 10,000 microbes, you should only have like 100 remaining. Mm hmm you know what I mean? So in other words, like looking at like the log kill rate, L-O-G, log kill rate of your cleansers will help you understand that, okay, if I apply this for this amount of time and I leave it wet for this long, I should expect to be able to reduce the microbe load on that surface by this much. Wow. Also, you know, one other thing, because I know a lot of people out there, uh, you know, they use like IPA, isopropyl. And a lot of people will think like, you know, intuitively 90% alcohol must be better than 70% alcohol, right? Of course. The number's higher, yeah. Right? And they hide yeah, it from you. Sense. They don't sell it everywhere. So it's got to be the good stuff if it's rare. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. The, the premium, the, yeah. The black label, That's right? That's what I always thought, well, genuinely. <laughs> no, no, no. And, and you're not, you know, for, for certain applications, you're not wrong. However, <laughs> don't backtrack. Yeah, cannabis, please. Let's go. <laughs> in cannabis. 70% is actually serving you better than 90% because what 70% IPA means is that there's more water within the mixture, which means that you have a greater amount of contact time or uh, before it evaporates. Whoa, that makes a ton yeah. of sense because the, the more pure yeah. the alcohol, the it'll evaporate much faster and it won't achieve that contact time to rack up those right. kills. Like you were saying that kill death ratio or whatever you called it. Yeah. Exactly. Kill I mean, listen, log. if you're cleaning your you're cleaning your bong, you're cleaning your pipe, yeah, 90 all day, every day. Can't stop, won't stop, right? Because you're just trying to get rid of the resins, right? But like if you're trying to clean tools, you're trying to clean tabletops, trimming surfaces, what have you, your better bet is to go with 70%. Damn. Because it has more time to, to denature the, the micro. And it's still powerful enough to get the job done, is what you're saying. Exactly. Wow. Exactly. Man. That's so, a fucking great tip. Yeah. And so, you know, and then, you know, I know like I kind of specialize in, in air management, but at the end of the day, man, it's like, I have to talk to people about all aspects of their grow, you know? And I mean, just from a liability standpoint for myself, because, you know, educating everybody on the problem, it's like, if I sell you an air filter and you're putting this air filter in and you're still having problems, you're looking at me like I'm the problem and I'm not the problem. There's, there's a problem. It's sort of like back when I was in lighting. Right. And it's like somebody be like, well, I don't know that your lights were really favorable, but it's like, well, you had some sort of other event in your room and the lights happen to be the newest thing in the room. So it's the easiest. Thing yeah. To light. Ain't that the truth? Yeah. That's that's the classic right. mentality. So you have to really think of of microbe control as a multi prong, multi level attack. So it comes down to like, I always break it down into like four questions and three solutions to okay. make the, you know, there's a lot of bullet points underneath it, but to try to just at least get people on the basic side of it, it's like the four questions are, where is it? So you got to test for it. You got to figure out where it is. Is it, is it on your doorknobs as you're coming in? Is it on your table surfaces? You got to find, you got to test. Is the thing it that's making air, you fail. Right? right. Right. So where is it? How did it get in? 
So now you have to kind of backtrace like the root cause of figuring, oh, okay, well, I don't do any gowning before I go, or I don't change my clothes before I go. I just go straight mm-hmm. from the living room into the garage where right. the tent is. And, you know, so now you're figuring out how it's getting in. Then you want to figure out what's allowing it to thrive. You know what I mean? So like, are your cleaning practices not up to snuff mm-hmm. or what have High you? High humidity, maybe. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and so, so how is it thriving? And then finally, how is it traveling? So in larger, you know, facilities, like, you know, is it in their HVAC system? Are they, you know, uh, it, it speaks to a number of the, the three solutions. So the three solutions without giving too much away earlier was number one, the way you're building out and avoiding as much organic material in your build as possible. I see wooden tables all day, every day, and nothing, mold loves nothing more than wood. Mm. You know, and so, God. and once you get mold in wood, you're never getting it out. So building with as many like synthetic materials as possible, you know, like, or, or stuff that's non-porous, you know, it doesn't have like, can't be, you know, live in the surface, always a plus. And then the next like kind of fix after you eliminate your, you know, the proper build out is uh, proper diagnostic and remediation equipment. So being able to to determine where this is and being able to track it, like again, particle counting, air sampling, you know, having proper ventilation or filtration within the room, like filter, for example, you know, that equipment that's constantly working for you or that you can deploy within your grow area to kind of help sniff out and do the detective work. And then the last thing is cultural practices where you know, employee practices or personal practices, meaning that like you want to avoid cross contaminating. So that, that again speaks to like gowning, for example. So if you're in a home grow patient level environment, you really want to like make sure that you're completely changing your clothes before you go in. You're not allowing your dog to come in and hang out with you while you're doing your work, you know, stuff like that. I mean, if you think about it, Aspergillus fumigatus, which is here tested for here in California, yeah, bud rot. the big, yeah, the biggest producer of it in your house is your pillow and your bedding. Get out of here. Kid you not started a huge fight with my wife over it. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cause I, I took a particle counter. I, I was, when I first started the job at lighthouse and they, they gave me a company issued particle oh counter and I'm just God. taking levels around my office and around my house. <laughs> okay. So now you're like, uh, now, now you're like a trigger happy cop. You got this nice device. You're just testing everything at this point. Oh yeah. And so <laughs> when I learned about Aspergillus fumigatus and our bedding, cause it's the perfect fire triangle, right? I mean, if you think about it, it's got the warmth of your body, it's got your sweat and your spit, and then all of the, the shit that's produced by the bed bugs that are just Jesus. naturally found in our beds, you know, like, ah. like the mites and stuff. Yeah. yeah. The pillow. Never yeah. tell my wife so, this. So, she'll never. She'll oh never yeah, no. Fucking... I, I showed it to her, and I was like, "Here's the air," and I was like, "Man, it's taking a sample of the air. See those numbers? See how low those are?" And then I stuck it onto the pillow, and then I, like the numbers were off the charts. And oh. she's like, "But I wash everything. I wash everything." And I'm like, "You wash the pillow, the pillowcases, but you didn't wash the pillows." Ah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Who washes pillows? <laughs> right, right. You, you move the headstone, but you didn't move the body. <laughs> 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 no kidding, dude. Holy shit. Right. So it's like, you know, I mean, if you think about it, if you don't shower or put some sort of barrier between you and your hair before you go in the facility and you touch something like, say, just your, you scratch your head and then you go right back to work and you don't change a glove or something like that. You've now potentially exposed that space, you know? And so it's a lot of what I call risk management. And like, for instance, in the larger facilities, like every room should have their own tools. Right. You know, if you're rocking like two 10 by 10 tents in your garage and you're trying to like flip alternating crops and you go into one and go into the other, you do not want to cross contaminate between those two. You know, you want everybody to have their own tools. Those tools are regularly cleaned, for example. It's worth the investment if your compliance, if you have a lot at stake. No you kidding. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, this, these are easy to implement best practices and 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 on so many levels too, all the way down to you know viroids being a big deal. Um, I'm sure that's a whole nother mm-hmm. that's a whole nother conversation. In fact, we don't have much time left here. Let's just really quickly. Um, I do have a few more things that I want to ask you, but first, yeah. uh, filterscience.com. Filterscience.com is where you can find uh, filter. And then uh, I'm sorry, Lighthouse. Will you give out the URL for Lighthouse? Yeah, yeah, Lighthouse Worldwide Solutions. It's www.golighthouse.com. And um, 
you notice it's a very like clean room, FDA compliant oriented website. Don't let the smooth taste fool you. You know, I, I handle the filter side of things and then I kind of broker in the, the, the particle counters and the air samplers and what cool. have you. And, you know, it's like as any company that's regulated by the FDA, they don't really want anybody knowing that they work with cannabis, but yet here we are. And so I, you know, I'm sort of like the cannabis guy for the company. That's you know, really where cool, I can, man. Because it's, it's, let me put it this way. We, we were in a regular, we, we serve regulated markets and we've been doing so almost 40 years. So it's like cannabis is newly regulated sure. and we know that it's like, you know, it's like breaking a crate of monkeys on an island. They all have to jockey for position and social order at a certain point, you know, and <laughs> We saw that writing on the wall with regard to like regulatory compliance and a lot of people just not even knowing where to start asking questions. And so that's where I try to really fill that gap, you know? This has been a very enjoyable interview. We're going to have to have you back on. I'd love if it. If you would give us more of your time, we'll do a Growcast TV, like a live stream type thing. Sure. Um, we're in the middle of uh, Breeder Feature February, I believe, but I just had to do this episode. And I figured that it's pretty um, relevant with people popping seeds. Like that's when microbial control is very important. Oh, yeah. um, again, maybe we'll cover that on our next one. There are a few more things I want to ask you here, though. I got to ask you this kind of a left turn, but but I just must. Sure. Testing. When people are testing for compliance, whether it be pesticide, all these things, we've had um, we've had the lovely Margo from Margo want to come on the show and talk about qualitative versus quantitative testing. This idea that there's a pass fail marker for some of these tests and they have to choose the quantity at which that pass or fail is right. And sometimes they won't even give you the quantitative test. They'll just say you passed or you failed. Mm -hmm. What do you think of qualitative versus quantitative? Where do they set these levels? Do you feel that they're too high, too low? What do you have to tell us about these kind of different markers? So, you know, I would say like most of the experience that I have is around just simply straight up detect, non-detect. Oh, I don't necessarily feel like that's a true marker of the safety of the product. You have to remember that the people who are making these laws and regulations, they don't in some case, in most cases, I'll say they don't have the benefit of having real world cannabis experience because we've been smoking weed that was grown in God knows what, God <laughs> knows where, and God knows how for decades, right? And that hasn't necessarily been that I can ever think of like a specific death as it related where someone took a puff of a joint and five minutes later, you found them, you know, keeled over on right. the couch dead. Doesn't happen. You know what I mean? It's more of a long term exposure thing that's why it's bullshit though because people do die from yeah, like aspirin is. or like tainted alcohol but it is important though much like coffee you're right it's a long-term exposure you don't want to be exposed to mold every day you can consuming right. it every day i get it yeah and so you know that being said it's like i don't think it's entirely fair and i don't think it entirely speaks to the quality of the product to have a detect non-detect you know a lot of that is because they, they they're basically trying to apply a pharmaceutical regulatory model to an industry that, that just never had to worry about that. And that ultimately the product I think is a lot safer, even in, in its original form than it ever was. Now I can tell you, you know, eliminating like PGRs and sure. eliminating pesticides. Yes. Like, yeah, I, I'm all for that. I'm, I am up and down all day. Right. I want as clean as possible yeah. when it comes to exterior chemicals. Right. But like stuff that is part of the natural process, you know, it's like the reason everybody's and, and I'll just kind of make this thought as quick as I can. You know, the reason that everybody is so hyped about uh, testing before market is because like, well, in terms of like, let's say there's like a big rush of like tainted lettuce, everybody gets the shits, right? And then they pull all the lettuce off the shelf. Right. That, that's because in the food industry and in like manufacturing of pills and supplements, when something's administered orally, your body has the ability to fight off any types of impurities through your stomach, through your gut lining, through your liver, through your kidneys. Your body has natural filters for things that are orally administered or orally taken in. Why everybody's so bent out of shape about testing before it hits market in cannabis is because when you're inhaling that product, uh. you're in, it is bypassing all of the body's natural filters and lodging deep in the lung sacs and going directly from the lung into the blood. Sure. You know what I mean? And so that's where you're, you're finding accumulations of buildup. And here's the thing though, man, you think that cannabis is the issue, dude? Like if you live in a metropolitan area, do you know how much crap I live in Los Angeles? Do you know how much shit I breathe in every day? Yeah. That's you what bothers me. You're worried about my weed? Yeah. You, you know, you're worried about my weed? Come you, on. I know you were talking earlier about picking, picking and choosing. That's what I hate is the regulators pick and choose as well. 
Yeah. And it's well, like, yeah, they do. It's very, now, very frustrating when they're like, yeah, you can't, uh, you can't have this weed. It tested bad. And now, now leave the building and you're like choking out from the smog. <laughs> Yeah, and, and as I understand the way Oregon, for example, developed their regulations, like they had somebody that was in the cannabis industry at the inception of their regulatory well, requirements. So they don't have the stringentness. Like an Oregon grower, I, God bless them, would never survive in California. Well, I'll tell you, I lived in both those states. I lived in Humboldt County for five years, and I lived in Beaverton uh, for Oregon for two years. Mm -hmm. And... um there's no situation where no one's feelings gets gets hurt. There's no legalization where nobody nobody's um you know plate breaks. Right. Somebody's gonna get gonna get burned. But being in Oregon, right. I have to say they've done one of the best jobs. They have dispensaries everywhere where you can go get rec at a reasonable price that's not completely overtaxed. If you're uh -huh. medical, you get your own line. You don't pay tax, so it's even more affordable. Um, the one thing I would say is wow. growers have a hard time because it, it did flood the market and prices are very low. Yeah. But they are still surviving. Um, you're actually allowed to see the product. There's some, either is even some organic product available for medical patients. That always really excites me. So yeah. I think they've done a very, very good job. Uh, again, I think some of the farmers and the low prices that that's going to happen, though. You know, this is this is an overvalued crop because of its prohibited nature in the past. And as that prohibition yeah. goes away, the price is going to come down. And I think I think the more cheap medicine we can get in the hands of patients, the better. But Oregon's done a good job, so that doesn't surprise me, and 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 yet also doesn't surprise me that probably wouldn't fly in California. Well, I mean, listen, you know, we thought that all the prices were going to come down in California, but in fact, they never changed. You know what I mean? An eighth is still sixty, and now you just have to pay a bunch of taxes on it. And now, in fact, they have the balls to charge you seventy-five in some places. <laughs> yeah, you know at the I mean? patient so level, like they've, you're right; it's never changed. Here, it's the same thing in Illinois. It's the worst. They've done a terrible, terrible job. And, uh, that's, that's why we encourage home grow. No, I completely agree. I mean, you know, obviously there are plenty of companies that are out there that are doing their due, but you know, it's like at the patient level, I, I think that, you know, you get a lot more care, you get a lot more personal attention. You can feel the love as opposed to like feeling the, you know, 55 gallon blue barrel that it was cured in, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like that industrial process, you can tell the difference in the level of craftsmanship and care. And it's unfortunate that I think that like the home growers to a certain extent are held to the same standard as, you know, uh, large scale commercial facilities. But at the end of the day, if you are held to that same standard, you still have to implement the same levels of risk management. And it's not an overnight process. You know, you start to look at your, at your space and you go, hey, where are my risks? Where's my points of cross contamination? And you start to eliminate them slowly but surely. And I do facility walkthroughs. I give them a honeydew list. And then they get through that and then I go back, I walk it again and I go, here's your next honeydew list and your next honeydew list. And every risk you can eliminate one by one just gets you that much closer to a consistently clean operation. Man, I absolutely love it. Jason, we got to have you back, buddy. I appreciate you so I love much. It. Awesome. You rule. Let's see here. Filterscience.com. Hit it up. Golighthouse.com. Follow Jason on Instagram at dyslexicstoner402. That is the handle, right? Yes. Yes. It's also sort of the, the test of like who I'm dealing with. Cause if you get the joke, I know who I'm talking to. You Absolutely. Know I mean? Yes. We have <laughs> dyslexia in my family friend. So I totally <laughs> understand. Yeah. The 402, the clever little spin there. Listen, this was great, man. I know the audience loved it. Uh, you will, you can look forward to Jason coming back on the show and, uh, yeah, that's all for today. Everybody also follow Growcast. We got our account back after getting banned. Hello. And uh, more importantly, check us out, growcastpodcast.com slash membership, the order of cultivation, our secret society of growers. All right, that's all for today. This is Jason and Jordan signing off, wishing you a great day out there. Be safe, everybody, and grow smarter. Keep being awesome, guys. That's all for today. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. Thank you to Jason. What a wonderful first time guest. Really, really funny guy. Before we wrap it up, of course, AC Infinity, one of our favorite partners, acinfinity.com. Code GROWCAST15 for 15% off virtually site-wide. Get yourself there. Thick, durable tents. Love those tents. Man, they are, they are truly my favorite tents in the game. Not to mention their fans. They make the best fans out there. They've got lights. They've got fabric pots scissors they've got everything you need and you use code growcast15 you save 15 percent plus don't forget anytime you use any of our codes get them to us take a snapshot and email them to us dm on instagram or discord 
you're automatically entered to win free seeds each and every month. ACInfinity.com, code GROWCAST15. You know them, you love them. Code GROWCAST15 for 15% off. All right, everybody, that's all. Again, thank you to Jason. Thank you for tuning in. So much going on. What's the date for this episode? I'm back in Oklahoma. We're going to meet up with the members. We might be staying there. We'll see how it goes. Big, big changes coming, everybody. Great things ahead. Of course, check out membership at growcastpodcast.com slash membership. We'd love to see you there. And we'll see you on the next Growcast. Terp Fiend is coming back. All right, everybody. Hope you're doing amazing things in your garden. See you next time. Bye-bye.